I think I worry about a lot of things, but one of my biggest worries is probably that I worry too much. Sometimes people call me worrywart or scaredy cat. My grandpa says nervous Nelly. I don't like that at all, and I know they're not trying to be mean, but it hurts mostly because I think it's true. And then I feel like my worrying annoys everyone. So I worry about that too. Sometimes I'm worried that no one will ever understand what I'm going through or that I'll ever fit in anywhere. I worry, then I worry about my worry. And who of us can't relate to that? That is a child's perspective of anxiety. And you're listening to Dear Anxiety. My name is Ed Krasnick. I'm joined by Rini Jane. This is a show all about how we deal with mental health. We're going to look at thoughts and feelings, and you can call it emotional fitness, resilience, happiness skills in today's world. And we're going to talk all about these kinds of issues that affect us every day. When it comes to mental health, we're all children. This episode is all about anxiety and why we worry about worry. This is a big epidemic in this country, anxiety. And we worry about it. And we're going to talk with, with uh, my co-host and my partner, who's a leading expert in resilience, anxiety relief, the founder of GoZen. And GoZen teaches resilience and happiness skills to kids, parents, schools, all over the world. And she has a master's degree in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania, Rini Jane. And Rini, that is a, a powerful thing. And of course, your title is the queen of anxiety relief. Yes, that is my title. I like to shorten it to Queen. <laughs> you can just call me Queen. <laughs> I will call you Queen. Now, you know, that is a powerful thing that we heard at the top uh, with a child journaling about anxiety. And you face this all the time. This is, this is, this is what you do in your work. Can you talk about that a little bit and, 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 and also how you came up with the name Dear Anxiety? Yeah, you know, I mean, what we heard at the top of the show is something that I'm hearing day in and day out that was really raw that is coming from an eight-year-old child that's not only talking about the fact that she worries, but this really metacognitive perspective, this observation that she's worrying about the fact that she worries. Wow, that is unbelievable to me. And it really kind of takes me back to my own childhood. You know, it, it hits me in that place. So you asked about the show name, Dear Anxiety. I think it's time to talk about it. I think it's time for everybody to talk about it. And what better way than to write a letter, whether that be voice recording it or whether you're writing it in a diary. But this is it's time to talk to the elephant in the room, which is anxiety. So Yeah, and the elephant in the room is actually sitting on my head uh, because that's <laughs> where it exists for a lot of people. It's, it's coming from inside myself. And you uh, started a company called GoZen. And, you know, I, you, you mentioned about your own childhood. Can you just give us a little background about how you came to, to work on a company that, that deals with resilient skills and that believes that happiness is, in fact, a skill. You know, I had a very clear path. I have an undergraduate degree in finance, and then I worked in technology. So obviously, this was like the next step. <laughs> no, yeah. it was completely nonlinear. What happened to me is, as a kid, I was chronically worried. You know, what if I don't get to go to the dance? What if I don't do well on this test? What if everybody sees I'm different? I what if all the time to the point where it disrupted my social life, disrupted my sleep, and it disrupted the well being of my entire family to the point where I could see the pain in my parents' eyes, my loving, compassionate, amazing, supportive parents that couldn't help me. They didn't know what to do. And so I, at the time, decided to just build this force shield around myself. I said, I'm going to build an emotional force shield so no feelings will go in or out. This is the perfect solution to this. So uh, when my mom would ask me, you know, what's going on? How's school? You're not talking about being worried anymore. I would say, oh, everything's fine. It's just, you know, I was going through something. It's fine. I'm fine. And 
I did that, I literally became an emotional stoic, you know, so it started around age seven or eight, and went all the way until my mid 20s. And um, I never learned any skills of resilience. So when I first, when I faced my first adult challenge, which was a big breakup, basically a relationship breakup, I didn't know how to cope. And so I started having panic attacks. All of that pain that I had stockpiled for years and years, all that worry that I pretended wasn't there came rushing out, gushing out, exploding out in the form of panic attacks. Fortunately, at that time, I found an amazing therapist. And my therapist kind of looked like Freud. It was sort of funny. And he's (laughs) talking to me and giving me these skills. So I was a traditional talk therapy, which is based in cognitive behavioral therapy. He's telling me that, you know, not everything you think is true. I'm like, excuse me, what? What was that? Yeah, you, um, a lot, there's a lot of inaccuracy in thinking this way. And there's a lot of inaccuracy when you worry. And so he started teaching me these skills of being able to think accurately. And I just, I pointed my finger up one day and I literally shot up from that sofa I was lying on it. And I said, excuse me, do you have a time machine? Because I want to go back to the eight-year-old version of myself and teach myself these skills. Why couldn't I have learned? And so it's one of those times in your life, you have a moment of clarity, right? A complete epiphany. And you say, I have to change my life. I left my tech career. I went back to school. I became a certified life coach. I got a master's in positive psychology. And I started creating animations for kids to teach them the skills. I really wish I learned when I was a kid. And that was the genesis for Gozen. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing, uh, amazing story. And, uh, and, and, and really, Gozen is used by so many people. And the first thing that you realize is that when it comes to mental health, we're all kids. We're all learning for the first time. No one is a real, you have to practice these skills, just like physical fitness. Look, if you want to get healthy, you go to a gym. But if you want to be mentally fit, where do you go? What do you do? Nobody, you know, we're, we're a country that's based on illness. We're based on surviving illness. We're not based on being well and learning. And what does that even look like for people? What is it to be well? And that's what we're going to explore in the show. We'll have different topics, but today we're focusing on anxiety, like Greeny was talking about, and also about the worry about worry, that people think that when you have these thoughts and feelings, first of all, they're you. And secondly, there's something wrong with you for having them. So I guess I want to, we're going to talk a little bit here about how parents deal with kids who suffer from anxiety. And, and I guess the first thing, Rini, I, I want to ask is what, you know, you experience this all the time. What, what is it, that, what is it that, that parents have to deal with when they're dealing with kids who suffer from anxiety? And I do want to jump into that in a moment, but Ed, uh, we would love to hear from you. So I told my little story of how I came to Go Zen, to founding Go Zen, but how did you come to this podcast? You're an Emmy-winning writer, a comedian, and now you're on Dear Anxiety with me. What's up? What's up with that? I basically, um, yeah, I mean, my whole life, like you, I had feelings and thoughts that I thought, you know, I thought there was something wrong with me for having feelings. I really did think that I was, not only did I think that there was something wrong with me, I thought I was bad. That's what I used in my head. I was bad. And I was so immobilized by um, depression and anxiety that I couldn't get out of bed. So outside my room, I would hear the voices of kids on the way to school and I can't move. So this happened off and on for many years. And I've done a lot of therapy um, and a lot of studying and a lot of made a lot of mistakes. And uh, if psychotherapy could be converted to frequent flyer miles, I'd be eligible for a free trip to Pluto. There's no question about that. But the rewards points that I get are that I get to um, learn that not only am I not a bad person, but I'm just a human being and that these feelings and thoughts are not me. 
Now, this is a daily thing because sometimes I think they are me. And then I have to actually practice a skill. And now I have a daughter who's going to be about to be 14. And I have to learn some very specific skills with her. She's a brilliant person, brilliant writer, and all kinds of things, very compassionate person who is now suffering from anorexia. So one of the skills that we're going to talk about in our next, uh, in our next little bit here, because the show, we, we want to teach some skills that people can actually use, um, is how to validate somebody who is very upset and who is experiencing a lot of distress and anxiety and not escalate, not join them in the anxiety, but hold the ground for them. Yeah. And thank you, Ed, for sharing with such candor, you know, the experience that you've been through and that you're going through. And that's what we're really going to try to bring to this show. And you were asking me earlier what parents have to deal with. And I think, you know, what you're saying right there with the ability to hold space for a child, you know, so we heard a child speaking at the beginning of the podcast, talking about worrying about their worry. And this might be something that you're dealing with in your own home. And maybe you've heard it a thousand times. So you're starting to lose your patience. So I wonder what we can do to help our listeners, Ed, what do you think? Well, the first thing that I, you know, that I want the, the listeners to know is that sometimes you hear people talking, if, if you hear people talking about this stuff, it seems like they know it all, they experience it all, they're perfect, they're experts. I'm a hot mess. Uh, let me just say that. I'm not <laughs> blaming myself. I'm not saying, but in today's vernacular, I'm a hot mess. Okay. And I can still talk about my mental health. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be an expert. I don't have to know how to do it all. So even when we practice these skills, it's going to look different in your house. You're not going to be perfect with it. But the point is to be conscious about what you're doing as opposed to just live on autopilot. Because if you're living on autopilot, you're going to be unhappy. That's what we want to what we want to talk about here. I mean, and the, and the first thing is when your kid is experiencing distress and yelling or screaming or having a lot of emotion, what is it that you can do? What do you do? I think the first thing that we have to do in order to maintain a connection with our kids is to empathize. And for those of you who may be rolling their eyes, oh my goodness, empathize with what's going on with my child, especially if they're acting out and their behavior is not the behavior that you want to see in the house is really hard, especially again, like I said earlier, if you if your child is exhibiting something repeatedly and you're just depleted, you know, this can be hard practice. But let me just put it to you this way. Ed, if you had a hard day at work and you came home to your partner, or your spouse, or your friend, and you were, you know, trying to express what was going on, even if it was a problem that's been going on for a long time, and you say, hey, honey, I had the worst day at work. You know, my boss did this. This is what happened. My client did this to me. And your honey looks at you and just rolls his or her eyes and says, listen, it's going to be fine. It's not that big of a deal. Trust me, you'll be fine. I know you'll get through it. They're still loving, right? And they're still maybe trying to be compassionate, but there's a disconnection. So for our kids, it's the same thing, right, Ed? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, exactly. I think that, but I think the difficult thing as a parent and why parenting is so hard or feels so hard is because as a parent, I feel like I have to fix it. In other words, I have to stop it. You feel like the victory is, oh, it stopped. Well, that's not the victory. The victory is engaging and relating to the person, and it's really simple. They say something, and you acknowledge that you heard what they said. That's no, all. It can't be that simple. That's it all you have to do. It can't be that simple. That is all you. Now, that does that mean that the that it's going to slow down? It may. It may not. It may go on for a while. And that's human. It's human to be upset. It's human to have all kinds of experiences. It's human to have anger. So why don't we do, Rini, why don't we do a little role play here where maybe you, you have a daughter, and just get, play out something. Tell me something that happens at home, and I'll be the parent. And the first thing I'm going to do is respond in the way that most parents would respond and the way that I often respond. Okay. So let me preface this by saying my daughter's five. So I'm going to step into her five-year-old mind right now. And here we go. 
Let's get ready to role play. Daddy, I don't want to sleep in my own room. I'm scared. I'm, I'm scared of the dark. I don't want to sleep there. I'm worried. Honey, you know that you're going to be okay. No, Daddy, you don't understand. I, I, it's scary in there. When the lights go off, I can't see anything. And then I wake up and you're not there and I'm scared. Please. Oh, we've, ta we've talked about this before. And you know you can always get through it. You know if you need me, I'm right next door. Honey, you're going to be fine. No, that's too far away. I'm not going to be fine. Oh, forget so, it. Forget yes. it. So, what, so what's going on there? What's going on is the way that I usually respond. And I'm not listening to her. I want to get back to bed. And I'm not being mean. I'm not listening. But I'm just not attending to what she's saying to me. So now we're going to try it another way with a skill that it really is just attending to what your kid is trying to say to you. Round two. Daddy, I don't want to sleep in my own room. It's scary. I'm scared. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry you you feel scared. It's uh, that's a it's hard feeling to there. have. Yeah, it is. It is. You you you're seeing that it's dark and it scares you. And I don't want to sleep alone. And why do I have to sleep by myself? Wow, you really sound like you're you're upset about this and you're worried about it. And you know what? Um, it's hard to it's hard to have those feelings. Sometimes people worry. I worry, and I know you're worried right now. I'm super worried. There might be a monster in my closet. Yeah. Well, you know what? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check, and you can come with me. And I have monster spray, by the way. I always carry that, and I'll give it to you. But also, it's okay to be to feel worried sometimes. And we're going to get through this together. And you can always talk to me, and I'll always help you. We have a winner! Wow. <laughs> I loved that. So, you know, uh, Ed and I are both parents, right? I have a four and a five-year-old. Ed has an almost 14-year-old. And we understand when you're woken up in the middle of the night that this may not be your demeanor. But I think the point is, is that we get if your knee-jerk response is wanting to fix something. And what we're saying to you is that the fixing can happen. But as a first step to any worry that comes to your doorstep is really mindful listening, active listening, and just being open to hearing what they have to say. Because we are not saying that all of their behavior is what you want it to be and where they want it to be, you as a family want it to be, but their feelings are okay, right? All feelings are okay. So we're just talking about the ability to, to be open and listen as a first step yeah, and I think I think what happens is you you want to match what their energy is. You're you're thinking I got to match it or often what happens to me is I speed up. Like what's going on inside is I start to panic a little bit because I feel like I'm tired. I feel tired. I don't have the skill to I'm going to get drained by trying to get a get ahead of her. And you don't need to get ahead of her. I don't need to fix it. Health doesn't mean that that everything stops. It means that we're connecting. Now, what's going on inside me? How do I deal with that? Because that's what often gets in the way for me as a parent. It's not what's happening with my daughter. It's what's happening inside me that I'm not paying attention to. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that we talk about this concept called minding the gap. So if you've ever traveled by train in the London Underground, right, if you've been there, when, you, when you're getting off of the train, there's this wonderful voice that says, mind the gap, please, please mind the gap. And the interesting thing is that between something that triggers you and your reaction, there is about a four second period where you can really mind the gap between the trigger and your reaction and you can bring yourself down from a ledge. And so the first step for any parent in a situation where you're getting triggered is to mind the gap. And that takes practice, but there are a lot of skills that we're going to talk about throughout our shows where you can work on that, right? So the first step is obviously your own self-regulation. It's your own ability to find that centered being that your child needs 
to guide them through this, right? And to know that you're their guide. You are not in control of everything that happens in their life, nor would you want to be, right? They are here to have their own experience, but you are their guide. And in order to be that best guide, that best advisor, you really need to mind the gap before you do anything. And if you're having a situation in your home that's happening repeatedly, so repeated waking at night, repeated need for reassurance, repeated whatever the repetition is of of the triggering event, then you should expect that this is what's happening in your home right now. And you can practice yourself because you do have control over that gap for yourself. So you're trying to create a pause in in terms of what's going on so that you can sort of gather yourself. And uh, and how how do you do that, Rini, in your in your house? So I practice all these skills myself. I am definitely it is not utopia in my house, as I've said before. I have a four and a five year old, and they're you know what would be called quote unquote highly spirited kids. We have a lot going on in the house all of the time, and I definitely get triggered. There are things that I can feel it. So one of my go-to techniques is to notice and name what's going on in my own body. So I will say, and it looks a little cuckoo because I'm doing it out loud for the most part, I'm feeling a tightness in my chest. And I'm some, sometimes I'll even say, I even really feel like I'll be relieved if I scream right now. And I'll say those words because, um, number one, it activates the language center in my brain, which is more in the logical part of the prefrontal cortex of your brain. And it kind of takes power away from the emotional brain, which is where you get triggered and you might you know, go into a rage. Um, so noticing where the feeling is that I have in my body and naming it and just literally narrating what's going on. And I've been doing this now for, you know, for years. So my kids see it and they will try to mimic me. Now, they're not always successful. However, they're trying and they see the modeling. So that's one of my kind of go-to techniques. That's amazing. So you actually say it out loud in front of your kids. I do say it out loud in front of my kids. So this is the biggest thing. You're modeling, you know, so often with parents, uh, you're say- <laughs> you catch yourself saying to kids, why are you angry? Don't be angry. You don't need to be angry. What do you have to be angry about? The irony in that is never lost on me. We're yelling at our kids not to yell. We're getting angry at them not to get angry. <laughs> it doesn't. We know it doesn't make any sense. Sometimes we feel like we can't help it. You know, it's our way to control a situation that we feel is out of control. And I think that that's the case with so much of, of life is that you think, I can't take a break now or I can't pause I have to react. My my whole body is telling me to do something. One of the things that that I do, and this is rare, but when I've done it, it's worked really well, is I ask myself a question in my head real quick. Would I rather feel this way or would I rather be free? And when I ask myself that question, everything stops. Doesn't matter what I'm feeling. Doesn't matter what I'm thinking. And uh, it seems like a strange question maybe for for the issues that come up. But you're just trying to create a pause. You just don't want to go on automatic pilot. Whatever it is that you do, these are the skills of mental health. These are skills that will help you to live better. Um, And these skills we often only practice. By the way, I want to say I love that question. um, But we often only practice these skills when we are in the moment. And And I will say regularly to parents and to educators that I'm working with, it's kind of like studying for a test while you're taking the test. It's nearly impossible. You can't do it. You have to practice it outside of the scenario. And so then parents will say, well, how do I do that? Because outside of the scenario, you know, everything's like hunky dory. So I, I don't know when to practice. And I always go to role playing. So you heard Ed and I doing a role play just now earlier. And you might think, oh, my goodness, my kids are not going to engage in role play or they're a particular age where they're going to think it's too cool. But trust me. All kids will do role playing if you make it fun and engaging and they love to play you. You know, do you want to be mom or dad or caretaker? They love that. They love that. Let me show you what you sound like, mom, you know, and say they will take on that role so that you can practice so that there's some muscle memory, right? So that there is some access to what we're supposed to do when we're actually in the heat of the moment because we've practiced it. And no matter what age you are, it doesn't have. Maybe you're single. Maybe you're you're a parent. Maybe you're uh, you're in a couple. It, it doesn't matter. 
you can always practice these kinds of skills. And of course, the best time to practice them is when you're not in distress, when you're just going through your day. Now, you do it when you're brushing your teeth, which is uh, amazing to me. <laughs> it's mental hygiene, right? I practice it when I'm brushing my teeth, dental and mental hygiene. You dental have to mental, do it. <laughs> the dental mental connection. Now, what are you what, what are you actually doing? I, I what am I doing? I'm brushing my teeth, and I am literally doing some preventative skill or one that I will use in the moment. So I'm often meditating when I'm brushing my teeth. So I will do some type of mantra meditation that I have, um, or I'm brushing and then I'm I'm breathing. So yeah, I'm that is that's my anchor. You know, we often need something to say, okay, while I'm doing this, I'm going to do this. It's an association that I use, kind of like a mnemonic, so I remember to do it in practice because I do mm. remember to brush my teeth twice a day. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna brush my teeth more, probably ten to fifteen times a day, because it's so easy to physicalize. It's it's so easy to think what I do for physical fitness. I go to the gym. I work. I exercise. But it's so challenging and difficult to think. I actually can exercise for mental health. I can actually exercise for my thoughts and my feelings. Not only what, what, can you, but you must. We must, yeah, right? Yeah. Because we yeah. fall out of practice very quickly. So oftentimes people will say, well, the things that you're teaching, how long do we have to do it before everything is good? You know. And I say, this is a lifestyle, right? We incorporate this into our lifestyle because the challenges will keep coming. And I also just want to bring up that what Ed and I are talking about today the ability to hold space for yourself, really in minding the gap and then hold space for the other in empathizing. These are, we're not saying that don't work on the problem and don't actively come up with a plan. We're going to talk about lots of things, lots of interventions that you can try with your kids, but these are really the foundational first steps. Right. So empathy, learning that the thoughts and feelings aren't you, and checking the facts on a thought. Is that, is that thought accurate or not? Those are empathy, separation, being a thought detective. These are skills that we're going to talk about in the future, too. Um, and, you know, I just, I just want to say this is for everybody. You know, sometimes we think this kind of conversation is really for people who shop at Whole Foods. And not to say that you shouldn't shop at Whole Foods. <laughs> they are not a sponsor, by the way. They're not yet, uh, but I would say it's for it's for everybody in any situation, any life situation. So, Rini, is there anything else you want to share with them? Or I do want to share that if you have a child that would like to share their story, that you can go to gozen.com forward slash dear anxiety. So it's gozen.com forward slash dear anxiety is where you can share stories and we will read them on air or if you voice record them we will play them on air and i also want to share one other special thing that we're doing ed which is you know a lot of times kids will have an issue or a challenge that they bring up and we assume that the only people that can help are grown-ups but i have found in my work that kids are some of the best advisors and teachers and have sage wisdom so to close out the show, I'd love to hear the advice of a child who is going to be speaking to the first child that we heard who was saying that she's worried about her worry. That's fantastic. And thank you for listening. Uh, keep coming back. It works if you work it. And uh, thanks for listening. And, and uh, yeah, let's listen to the advice of a, of a, of a child. A lot of kids do worry, and it's okay if you do, because sometimes worry is meant to protect you. Other kids have worry, and they're not alone. If kids are called names because they worry too much, I would tell them, don't listen to them, because you are you. That is who you are, and you can't really change. People will understand what it's like to be a worrier because they probably will be thinking like, okay, other people go through these things, so it's okay that that person is going through it too.